is Dr. Walter Fairservice. Professor, uh, as an authority in the field of uh, anthropology, is there anything new that has been learned about the uh, evolution of man down through the centuries? Oh, yes, David, a great deal. Indeed, uh, there are many mysteries that remain, however. A puzzling question is, of course, the, the evolution of culture. The recent identification of Australopithecus afarensis from Eastern Africa has provided us with a clue to human evolution heretofore unknown. The human morphologists, they, well, they work on the question of whether this individual was a thinking individual. And as far as Homo sapiens is concerned, or more of that of the primitive ape or simian variety. Hmm. Uh, does the extinction of the dinosaur have any uh, reference to modern man? Well, of course, the dinosaur was followed by the tertiary ape. Fourteen years before I was born, there was the Orangeburg Massacre. The Orangeburg Massacre, we saw South Carolina Highway Patrolmen kill four people. Three uh, black men and one baby Louise Kelly. A woman had a miscarriage because of what South Carolina Highway Patrolmen did February 8, 1968 in Orangeburg, South Carolina. So you had Henry Smitty Smith, you had Samuel Hammond, Hammond Jr., Delano Middleton, and baby Louise Kelly. Those are the four people that were killed. So this is 50 years ago, 1968. Bobby Kennedy is going to get killed in 68. MLK is going to get killed in 68. Henry Smitty Smith, Samuel Hammond Jr., Delano, Delano Middleton, and baby Louise Kelly. The woman's name was Louise Kelly, so the baby doesn't actually have the name, so I just called it Baby Louise Kelly. So Sam played football. He was a popular guy. Three students demonstrating in South Carolina State University in Orangeburg, South Carolina. This is called the Orangeburg Massacre. So they were protesting racial segregation at the town's only bowling alley. And the man who owned the bowling alley said, no, he wasn't going to change anything because it's a private establishment. But they made the argument that since they had a countertop, there was a restaurant, they served food there. Since they served food, then therefore the 1964 Civil Rights Act applied to All-Star Bowling Alley. A white guy went in there, and he got the bowl. When the black kids went in there, they were denied entrance. Samuel Feemster protested outside the bowling alley as police and state troopers lined the street. Someone pushed into a glass window, then the glass window broke. People started to run, move out of the way. Uh, cops got excited. They started swinging the clubs. There were some people that got really beat up that night. That would be February 7th. The next night, February 8th, 1968, Walker says he, his friend Henry Smith, whom everyone called Smitty and others, hung around a bonfire on campus. However, Walker didn't feel well. He went to the infirmary, and then he's going to go to the dorm. Then in about two or three minutes, when he walked into the infirmary, there was uh, loud explosions. It didn't sound like gunshots, but all explosions all at one time. Boom, 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 boom. Moments later, he said he, uh, there was students filling the infirmary with gunshot wounds, bodies, blood everywhere. Smitty, who was close by, got killed. Feemster made it to his... Dorm, when he heard the shots, we sat on the floor. We didn't want to be in the windows because we were afraid they were marching on the campus. Feemster said he knew Samuel Hammond, Jr. Another student witnesses say state troopers killed. Another victim, Delano Milton, high school student. He was waiting on his mother to get off work. She worked on campus. So it's the 50th anniversary of the Orangeburg Massacre. 2018 is the 50th anniversary of this Massacre that happened February 8, 1968, on the night of, when the high schoolers, Samuel Hammond, Henry Smith, Delano Middleton, all were slain by police gunfire. 28 other uh, students were wounded. None of the students were armed. Almost all were shot in their backs, butt, sides, and on the soles of their feet. So this was mainly targeting all-star bowling 
in downtown Orangeburg. They want to desegregate it. Henry K. fucking Floyd, Henry K. 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 Floyd, he said the Civil Rights Act didn't apply to his establishment. So they had to go through the legal justice system, appeals to the U.S. Justice Department, so eventually, nobody's listening to these students, even though there are black and white members of the community trying to tell Harry KKK Floyd to let black folks bowl. Floyd denied them the right to play, and after the police arrived, the students returned to campus. So the police came, and then they left. So 40 South Carolina students went in February 5th on a Monday. Senior John Stroman entered the alley, and he denied them the right. Cops were called. They went home. Tuesday night, you had John Stroman try again. This time, they were met by 20 police officers who initially barricaded the bowling alley's locked door. But once the door was open, then John Stroman and over 30 others entered the premises, where they remained for just under half an hour. In acknowledgement of the brewing intention, Pete Strom, longtime chief of the state law enforcement division, had been dispatched to Orangeburg to try to maintain peace. After speaking with Strom, Stroman asked the female students to go home and advised all remaining protesters to leave if they did not want to be arrested. Fifteen students chose to stay, hoping their arrest would compel the issue's resolution in court. As they were led to waiting patrol cars, an angry cra crowd gathered outside the bowling alley. New recruits arrived from campus, and some of the incoming students armed themselves with bricks obtained from a nearby construction site. An intervention by Henry Vincent, South Carolina State's dean of students, secured the release of the jailed students, including Stroman, who returned to the parking lot and tried to settle the scene down until a fire truck ordered by the police chief, Roger pa Poston, arrived. A newcomer to Orangeburg, Poston, was unaware that local students had been sprayed with fire hoses at a 1960 sit-in. At this point, fear and a sense of betrayal swept the young crowd, despite pleas from Stroman, who climbed onto a car to calm fellow demonstrators. By then, at least 50, some say as many as 100, law enforcement officers were present. Many Brandison truncheons. Both Poston and Stroman made repeated calls for calm, but it was too late to see its Seeds of riot had been sown. Three to four hundred students rallied. A surge of angry youngsters pressed against the bowling alley storefront, hurling insults and fists. The troopers responded with broad-scale beatings. One man's skull was cracked, and reports from that night bear witness to at least two female students being held down and clubbed by officers. Wounded and enraged, the students broke windows out of the cars and four buildings during their retreat. Wednesday, February 7th, passed in a haze of whispers and waiting. Classes on campus were canceled, and students met to plan a protest march for later that day. Permits were sought but denied by Mayor E.O. Pendarvis in the city of Orangeburg. Instead, white officials and businessmen came to campus, but their lack of support, in some cases their obvious disdain, further fueled the students' dissent. Together with professors, the student body compiled a formal list of grievances, presented them at City Hall late that afternoon. The list asked for 12 items a third of which focused on injustices within the local medical community. For example, number five asked that the Orangeburg Medical Association make a public, make a public statement of intent to serve all persons on an equal basis regardless of race, religion, or creed. Number nine asked leaders to encourage the Orangeburg Regional Hospital to accept the Medicare program. Along with all-star Bolin, Orangeburg Regional Hospital remained segregated in spite of federal law. So even though all-star bowling was the primary focus, the Orangeburg Regional Hospital remained segregated in spite of federal law. By Thursday, February 8th, roughly 120 armed National Guardsmen, state highwaymen, and local policemen had amassed at the edges of South Carolina State's campus. Both South Carolina State and Clafin were placed on lockdown. An additional 450 troops were stationed downtown. The officers were issued shotguns loaded with double ot buckshot used to kill deer and other large game. Even now, those present in Orangeburg that winter speak of the eerie calm that descended upon the community. They also recall the brutal temperature. Dean Livingston, longtime editor of Orangeburg's Daily Paper, paper the Times and Democrat later said, in cold, it was so cold, one of the coldest nights I think I can recall in my life. 
So the coldest night ever. The night is darkening as fell. Students at South Carolina State gathered on a hill at the school's entrance holding hands and singing. At 10 p.m., they lit a bonfire. 30 minutes later, firemen moved in to douse the blaze, backed by just under 70 officers. The students began to retreat, but someone either threw a rock or a banister hit a highway trooper named David Shealy in the face. Shealy fell to the ground bleeding. Another officer fired his gun in the air as a warning, later claiming they feared the shot had been fired by a student. Eight other officers and a city policeman opened fire. So nine cops for about eight to 15 seconds. Just pow, 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 between 100 and 150 students were present. Of these, 31 young black people were shot. Three of the adults who died, one miscarriage. Samuel Ephesians Hammond Jr., Harry Ezekiel Smith, ages 18 and 19 respectively, were students at South Carolina State. De De Delano Herman Middleton was 17 years old, a senior at nearby Wilkinson High School. Middleton was not involved in the protest. His mother worked as a maid on campus. He often stopped there on his way home from basketball practice and all. He was shot seven times, once in the heart. Henry Smitty Smith, an ROTC student and native of Marion, was shot three times, including in the neck. Sam or Sammy Hammond was a freshman from Barnwell who was studying to be a teacher. He shot in the back and died on the floor of Orangeburg's segregated hospital. Also killed was the unborn child of Louise Kelly Cowley. Age 27, one of the young women beaten during the protest at All-Star Bowling. Callie suffered a miscarriage the following week. Cleveland Sellers, a 23-year-old Bamberg County native who served formerly as a program director for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, was arrested on riot charges. Two and a half years later, he was convicted and sentenced to a year in prison. Conversely, every law enforcement agent, all nine cops who shot and killed four people, were acquitted. Cleveland Sellers, who'd been shot during the attack, was eventually pardoned in 1993, 25 years later, after evidence proved he was innocent. In the intervening years, he earned his master's degree from Harvard, his doctorate from UNC at Greensboro. For eight years, he served as the president of Voorhees College, located in his hometown of Denmark, before stepping down in 2016 due to his failing health. None of the nine officers even got an informal reprimand. So it was very cold in 1933. It was very cold also, negative 23 degrees Fahrenheit, negative 31 degrees Celsius. It was re recorded in Seminole, Texas. So February 8, 1933 was very cold, the coldest ever in state record, negative 31 degrees Celsius in 68. So 35 years later in, uh, on the East Coast. It was very cold also. 1963 was the first transmission of the clandestine voice of the Iraqi people to a communist radio station. 1963, the first transmission of the communist radio station called the clandestine voice of the Iraqi people. 1920, the Bolshevik troops capture Odessa, capturing an end to foreign involvement in the resistance against Bolshevik rule. February 8, 2013, 100,000 people marched to demand justice for the atrocities of the Bangladesh Liberation War in Dhaka. In 1672, Isaac Newton's scientific revolutionary reads the first optics paper before Royal Society in London. He was born December 25th. He's actually real, a real dick. Isaac Newton was a piece of shit, killed people for uh, counterfeiting money. He was a part of the government, and he executed people. So very selfish. He was, you know, 1672. Everything changed with Newton, scientific revolutionary. But he was a piece of shit. Anyways, February 8th, he read a paper to some people. 1943, the Red Army recaptures Kursk. February 8th, 1943, the Red Army's general, Ivan D. Chernyakovsky. <laughs> Chernyakovsky, Chernyakovsky. So Ivan D. Chernyakovsky achieved a combat record that is virtually unknown in the West on January 25th, 1943. Chernyakovsky's men liberated the city of Voronezh 
and on February 8th, now under command of the legendary General Konstantin Rukasovsky, he recaptured Kursk. So Chin Chernyakovsky, Chernyakovsky, Chernyakovsky was part of the Red Army recapturing Kursk, 1943, February 8th, 1992, when I was 10 years old. 10 years old, February 8th, 1992. The number one song was by Wright, said Fred, I'm too sexy for my shirt, so sexy, yeah. I'm too sexy for my shirt, too sexy for my walk, too sexy for my hair, too sexy for everything. <laughs> so, cool song, huh? I'm too, that was when I was 10, 10 years old, 1992. This is when Bill Clinton was running for office. 1924, the gas chamber is used for the first time to execute a murderer. This was with G. John on February 8th, an unsuccessful attempt. So, anyways, Nevada State Prison, Nevada, Nevada, Nevada. I don't even know anymore. <laughs> Looks like Nevada to me. So, Nevada State Prison. Chinese national with the first person. If you have a choice between Nevada or Nevada, why wouldn't you pick the tougher one? Nevada is more better. What the hell? And it's also the Spanish version, too. So he killed somebody, and it was like some internal thing. It was in the same gang. One gang member, two young gang members killed an older gang member for some reason while he was in his pajamas. But eventually they were apprehended. And since it was clear case of homicide, then they had authorized the use of lethal gas, and then it's like a big to-do. They tried to do it. It didn't work. And then they put him into a thing, and then eventually uh, they didn't even do an autopsy out of him because they are worried that the remaining gas could be released and they could die. He was 29 years old when he was killed. So there was liability concerns, which is kind of wild. The only distributor of liquid cyanide was the California Cyanide Company of Los Angeles. They were worried about liability, so they refused to deliver it. Then eventually the warden, Denver S. Dickerson, went and got the thing. 2008, Nebraska bans the electric chair as an execution method. They said it's unconstitutional. It's a violation of human dignity. Electrocution's proven history of burning and charring bodies is inconsistent with both the concept of evolving standards of decency and the dignity of man. And it went on to say that electrocution has proven itself to be a dinosaur more befitting the laboratory of Baron Frankenstein than the death chamber. So, yeah, that's absolutely true, than the death chamber. So, therefore, the gas chamber is more... Humane, and it is. Some people say just shooting someone in the head is humane. Is there a humane way to murder? But if there is a humane, electrocuting them, suffering, you know, drowning them, there's the uh, lethal injection where they're shooting people up, there's electric chairs, which Nebraska is saying bullshit, and then the death chamber. Some bad things, I think it's important to memorize everything. Uh, that story with the Orangeburg Massacre I just remembered it happening, but I was trying to promote the day, and I was like, well, I can't mention it, but it bugged me that I ignored that this was, that it was called a massacre, an interesting fact, the Boston Massacre, I think, had like three deaths, there was four deaths that had happened in the Orangeburg Massacre, so four deaths, that's not much of a massacre, right, it was very much, but it was 68, integration was just beginning, so everybody was segregated, and the wall was integration, and this bowling alley, all-star bowling with the KKK guy, he wouldn't integrate. So that needed to happen, but unfortunately the police officers were on the side of him. The Civil Rights Act was very fucking clear, but all the cops were on the wrong side. The military, 200, 450, all these cops to stop black folks from going to the bowling alley. And you know what? Those cops could have been present to make sure they were allowed to bowl. And it, probably, it wouldn't have taken as many. All you need to do is just tell the one fucking guy to listen to the law, but instead of telling the one racist white man who owned a bowling alley to listen to the law, it was easier, easier to get hundreds of police officers to... And then also, what's up with the nine cops that are just shooting into the crowd? Just shooting into the crowd, injuring 30 people, 
including a baby, made a woman uh, commit a miscarriage. Some other bad things that happened on February 8th, that was in 68 and 1980. Jimmy Carter, he revealed his plan to reinstate the Selective Service Draft registration. I thought the draft was wiped out, but Jimmy Carter brought it back. Oh, great, Jimmy Carter. Even though it's been said that Jimmy Carter didn't bomb anybody, he still reinstated the fucking draft. The Selective Service Draft registration is still legal today. It's actually illegal if you're an 18-year-old male and you don't sign up for the draft. There could be consequences. So people talk about illegal immigration. If that's the law, that's the law. If you didn't sign up for the draft, technically speaking, you could go to prison. You can go to prison with one to five years and because of Jimmy fucking Carter. 1925, February 8th, Marcus Garvey enters a federal prison in Atlanta. Three months in jail, waiting bail, sentenced to five years for mail fraud or some shit. Eventually, he's deported to Jamaica after Calvin Coolidge commuted his sentence. So Marcus Garvey was a, a very pretentious, very uh, ostentatious, very... He was king. He basically said he was like the Ethiopian king, and there was a big movement. There was some Garveyites. Malcolm X's father was a Garveyite. But they caught him for some mail fraud, for some bullshit, if that was even true. But while he's awaiting bail, he's in jail, then he's sentenced, but then eventually he's deported to Jamaica. Would you rather live in Jamaica as a free man, or would you rather stay in jail? Marcus Garvey chose Jamaica. So he gets exiled, right? Marcus Garvey, how dare you black man declare that you're the king and all this other stuff. Marcus Garvey was actually in favor of the KKK and a lot of the, um, I guess, I don't know, the liberal whites plan of, not, uh, of liberating blacks in Liberia. So send them back to Africa. Marcus Garvey was like, give me a ticket. I'm ready to go. But instead of going to Africa, they only got him a ticket to go to Jamaica. 1911, the U.S. helps overthrow President Miguel de Villa of Honduras. Hillary and Obama would do the same in 2009. Honduras is still having issues today. There's still refugees being run out of Honduras because of pro-capitalistic, imperialistic, colonial forces. A lot of corporations make sure corporations are people, and they're being defended, but the actual people aren't being defended. She's a warmonger. She was very shrill. Honduras, this stage-managed revolution was launched by an American banana planter who was angry at President Miguel de Villa's efforts to limit his land holdings and to tax his exports. So how dare you tax my exports of your country's crops while I'm in your country using your people's labor. It was planned at the May Evans Bordello in the Storyville section of New Orleans. So while chilling out in Louisiana, hey, let's overthrow Honduras's government. American troops arrived to assure its success. So we actually sent troops. This is 1911. 1911. Would that be Teddy Roosevelt? Or would that be was it Woodrow? There was Teddy. And then there was Woodrow, Wilson. Right. Teddy, Wilson. There's three progressives. And then you had the laissez-faire deregulationist. So 1911. I don't know who the fuck the president was in 1911, but what the fuck? You know, we've overthrown Honduras again and again. We've fucked with Central America, and we're in Venezuela right now, in Cuba. Sounds like we're invading Cuba, we're invading Venezuela, pretending like they're fucking dictators, when really they're just uh, consolidating their presidency. So it doesn't sound like to me that, that Manuel, you know, whatever, and um, Venezuela's going to stay there forever. But Trevor Noah saying that he is. So, that happened, right? The U.S. overthrows President Miguel de Villa of Honduras. February 8, 1911, Marcus Garvey enters federal prison in Atlanta. February 8, 1925, Jimmy Carter brings back the draft. February 8, 1980. 1980, President Jimmy Carter... So, 80, he was president in 80, 81 would have been, got his last fucking year in there. 2021 will be the same calendar year as 1982, so it'll feel like deja vu all over again. 
Amethyst is a modern birthstone for February. Bloodstone is a mythical birthstone based on Tibetan origin for February. It all kind of sounds like astrology. Astrology sounds scientific, but it's bullshit. Astronomy is the study of the stars in space. Astronomy is an actual scientific study. Astrology is fucking horseshit. It's almost like the alchemy, right? Trying to make, turn shit into gold. So alchemy is bullshit. Uh, astrology, it's magician, magic, bullshit, I mean, God, only a Christian nation can believe astrology, bullshit, once you believe in Adam and Eve and God and all the bullshit, you'll believe in astrology too, astronomy, the study of outer, outer space is real, astronomy is real, astrology, bullshit, real quick, the, it has nothing to do with February 8th, but death's messenger, this is Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm, in ancient times, a giant was wandering along the highway when suddenly a stranger jumped toward him and shouted, Stop! Not one step farther! What? said the giant. You, a creature that I could crush between my fingers. You want to block my way? Who are you that you dare to speak so boldly? I am death, answered the other one. No one resists me, and you too must obey my orders. But the giant refused, began to wrestle with death. It was a long, violent battle, and finally the giant got the upper hand and knocked death down with his fist causing him to collapse by a stone. The giant went on his way, and death lay there conquered, so weak that he could not get up again. What has become of this, he said. If I stay lying here in a corner, no one will die in the world. It will become so filled with people that they won't have room to stand beside one another. Meanwhile, a young man came down the road, vigorous and healthy. He was singing a song and looking this way and that. Seeing the half-conscious individual, he approached him with compassion, raised him up gave him a refreshing drink from his flask and waited until he regained his strength. Do you know, asked the stranger, as he stood up, who I am and whom you have helped on to his legs again? No, answered the youth. I do not know you. I am death, he said. I spare no one, nor can I make an exception with you. However, so you may see that I am grateful. I promise that I will not attack you without warning, but instead will send my messengers to you before I come and take you away. Good, said the youth. It is to my benefit that I shall know when you are coming and that I will be safe from you until then. He went on his way and was cheerful and carefree and lived one day at a time. However, youth and good health did not last long. Soon came sickness and pain, which tormented him by day and deprived him of his rest by night. I shall not die. He said to himself, for death will first send his messengers. But I do wish that these wicked days of sickness and pain were over. Regaining his health, he began once more to live cheerfully. Then one day, someone tapped on his shoulder. He looked around, and death was standing beside him, who said, Follow me. The hour of your departure, departure from this world has come. What? replied the man. Are you breaking your word? Did you not promise me that you would send your messengers to me before you yourself would come? I have not seen a one of them. Be still, answered Death. Have I not sent you one messenger after another? Did not fever come and strike you and shake you and throw you down? Had not dizziness numbed your head? Had not gout pinched your limbs? Did your ears not buzz? Did toothache not bite into your cheeks? Did your eyes not darken? And furthermore, has not my own brother's sleep reminded you every night of me? During the night, did you not lie there as if you were already dead? The man did not know how to answer, so he surrendered to his fate and went along with death. So essentially, sleep reminds you of death. Sleep, toothache, sickness, your eyes are dark in old age. Old age, sickness, dizziness, fever, sickness, sleep. How many more messengers do I need to warn you? Death is on its way. Death is going to happen. The solar system was formed 4.6 billion years ago from the gravitational collapse of a giant interstellar molecular cloud. Earth is 4.5 billion years old, so that's, you know, Earth is actually younger than the solar system. The first appearance of liquid water on Earth was 4.4 billion years ago. The earliest, earliest appearance on life on Earth was 4.3 billion years ago. 4.6, 4.5, 4.4, 4 4.3. First is the solar system. God made the solar system, said it was good, waited 0.1 billion years, created Earth, said it was good, waited 0.1 billion years, created the appearance of liquid water on Earth, and then waited another 0.1 billion years before life on Earth was allowed to form. So not one day, 0.1 billion years, and then eventually 4.3 billion years 
ago, life appeared on earth. Never forget about the Ordovician Silurian extinction events, the late Dovinian extinction, the Permian Triassic extinction event, the Triassic Jurassic extinction event, and the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event. One of the most exciting cities in the tri-state area, it's Late Night with David Letterman. Tonight, Francis Ford Coppola, humorist Henry Morgan, champion dogs from the Westminster Kennel Club, professor of anthropology Walter Fairservice, and a special Late Night report on the fabulous February 8th Day Parade. And now, a man who thinks the Earth has broken out of its orbit and is hurtling toward the sun, David Letterman! much and uh, good morning welcome to late night my name is David Letterman I hope you folks uh, had a nice weekend anybody here whose mother attended Ball State University just <laughs> when the increases took place in inflation and in tax rates and there were 8 million unemployed we didn't go to the present 9 million from full employment we were pretty well on our way there to begin with our plan is based on the idea that government spending, the rate of increase in government spending must be reduced until it comes down within the limit of the normal increase in our revenues that we gain from taxation. The second point is that we must have an economic program of taxes as we have now that will stimulate and offer incentives to the economy to broaden the base of the economy so that the, even the government will get the revenues it needs, but from smaller assessments against each individual. And the third phase of it is thousands of regulations that have been passed over the last few decades, conflicting, competing regulations inflicted on local government, on state government, and on the private sector. Unnecessary regulations, some you could laugh at if they didn't hurt so much. Well, under the vice president, we've had a task force. Another fascinating individual, Henry Morgan, will be here. And two other elements. We have dogs now from the... <laughs> A man just coming to... Um, <laughs> probably seeing Bolivian sailors himself just about now. We have dogs from the Westminster Kennel Club show, which is taking place right now at Madison Square Garden. And these are dogs, unbelievable specimens. Also, a little bit later, if you're thinking of dozing off, don't do it, because we have something which I like to refer to as truly breakthrough television. I don't think ever before seen on American TV. That'll be coming up a little bit later. Come on over here and uh, say hello to Mr. Paul Schaefer and the band. Hello, Paul. Hello. You know, one of the uh, exciting parts about living in New York City is that uh, every day there is something special going on in this town. Uh, earlier today, of course, was the thrilling annual February 8th Day Parade. Uh, we went right outside and took a look. Here is our special coverage now of that parade. Here comes uh, Keith Giesler of Staten Island. He was the, uh, well, now let's see, this is the mayor's float. They thought the parade was next week. And here come the lovely... Uh, Central Park Majorettes. There they are over there, followed up closely by the Queen and her court. 
And of course, their security guard. Going, it, it, it's, it's so easy for someone to come in and say, well, we don't like that idea or we don't think uh, that's like anything that's done well. So, so really, uh, if you want to start, my feeling is just start and, <laughs> and follow your heart. And, and, and really, Godfather 2, I remember, we had spent a million dollars building the sets before Paramount ever told us we could make it. Now, see, now what would have happened uh, if Paramount said, oh, we've decided against it? I mean... Well, you... that's sort of what ha has happened to me at certain times, and this notion of me being a risk-taker isn't really so true. It's not that I'm a risk-taker, it's just that once we're making the film, we don't want to stop, and we, we sort of, maybe in a naive way, think that, oh, it'll all work out. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we really just keep, you know, like, what would happen if they said, look, the money for the show is gone now, and uh, do you want to keep doing it, or should we tell the audience to leave? And, and uh, I mean, we tell, let's do the show and worry about it when it's all over. Yeah. yeah. And that's, how, that's really how it is. It, it, it's the risk part is the least important. We're not thinking about that. We're thinking about the film. Uh, the, the film won from the heart. Uh, we have been led to believe, uh, maybe uh, you shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't be believing this, but it looks like if this one doesn't work, there goes your house, there goes the speedboat, there goes the uh, vacation, there goes the studio. Well, the speedboat went on apocalypse. <laughs> uh, I know that's meaningless to you folks at home, but we enjoyed it, didn't we, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, I had a great weekend, and I hope uh, you had a pretty good weekend. Let me tell you, I don't really like to talk about my personal life, uh, but I'm, I'm going to for just a second here, and then you folks can talk about yours. Um, <laughs> after the show Thursday night, it was kind of exciting because we had completed uh, one week of, of this extravaganza, as, as we uh, like to call it. And so uh, I thought I would take the staff of the uh, show out to dinner at a, a very nice, swank uh, New York City restaurant. So. Uh, after the show Thursday, we all went over to Tad's, and, uh, um, <laughs> um, we were having plenty of fun, and this is so embarrassing to me because it happens over and over again, and I keep forgetting about it, and then it'll happen again, and it's so embarrassing. I had a couple of beers, and, uh, the next thing you know, I black out, uh, I come to about eight hours later, <sighs> there's a couple of Bolivian sailors going through my sock drawer. I just... <laughs> Doesn't, doesn't really mean anything, but uh, just kind of my way of saying welcome to the show. And uh, what a show we have got for you folks this evening. Uh, I, and I'm not kidding. Um, Francis Ford Coppola will be joining us tonight on this television program. Uh, that's right. You may certainly applaud if you like. Working on those regulations. And already, as I said the other night in the State of the Union address, there are now 23,000 fewer pages in the federal record which lists the federal regulations than there were when we started a year ago. And we're going to do more. And we have a task force at work also on fraud and waste and extravagance in government. When people say that our programs, if we're reducing the amount of money or the increase needed for some of the social programs. We're trying to get at the people who were never intended to participate in those programs in the first place, but who through the conflicting federal regulations and loopholes, legally or technically, are participating and there is no real need for them to be helped at the expense of their neighbors. This is what we're trying to do to change. To give you an example of how much that Apocalypse Now was the worst film they saw in 30 years, which means this was only the worst film they had seen in three years, <laughs> as I saw. Um, uh, you, this this uh, movie, One from the Heart, was done entirely uh, in your house, your facility, your own studio. Our studio in uh, Hollywood Zoetrope Studios is like the... It's not even the American motors of, of the movie industry. It's mm -hmm. kind of the Vespa. But, uh, but uh, we've been in business 12 years. We've never made a flop. We've produced such films as the Godfather films, American Graffiti, uh, Black Stallion, uh, Apocalypse, many films. We've introduced 
more new directors. We introduced George Lucas, uh, produced his first films, and Carol Ballard and lots of people. We brought a lot of new actors. And so sort of we would like to be an official little movie company based on those Now, this is a rarity, isn't it? Which? Uh, having your own little independent studio turning out big, huge motion pictures? Yeah, but of course it's more like the early days of movies yeah. when it was fly by your pants and the people in the film business were not so much businessmen, but they were like, they were former garment industry people, mm -hmm. so they were used to what it is to invest in next year's hemline. Mm -hmm. So there was the element, uh, element of risk Taking in, in movie, movie making. It has to be. Okay, we have to uh, interrupt here. Much out there is to be found and how much work counting on in the coming year. Our task force, just with one foray, not a nationwide investigation of this as yet, has found that in one program, 8,500 recipients of benefits are still receiving those benefits and they have been dead an average of seven years. That's why the other part of our program, which you can call a fourth point I proposed the other night, which is the federalism program to get government in at least 40 odd programs back into the hands of local and state governments where it can be run properly by people closest to the scene and not mismanaged by the federal government. I've talked longer than I intended to, but I'm just going to say one more thing. A lot of the demagoguery you will hear will be about the fact of the defense budget. And if anything has to be cut, why don't we cut that? We don't cut it because that's what's been going on for the last several years. And it will take us until the middle of the 1980s before we can even begin to come close to equating what the Soviet Union has built up to threaten us with. It is absolutely necessary that we restore that capacity to defend ourselves. And when I look at these young people down here, and I'm so happy to see them here and to participate. For people. Do, do, the, do the critics bother you? Nah, no. Not really? No. You just... They used to, I think. Uh... I think Apocalypse was the last time because they were so rough on Apocalypse. I mean, literally, I had a, I remember getting off a plane and getting a Time magazine that says Apocalypse Now is the most disastrous film made in 30 mm. years. And, and, you know, I didn't feel that certainly that was yeah. the case, yeah. you know. But people are very extreme with things that are different. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate you being here tonight. Good luck with the film. Francis Ford Coppola, One from the Hearts. We have to pause. We'll be right back. <laughs> Hi there, and good morning. Welcome back to Late Night. You know, one of the difficult things about putting together a new show is deciding what kind of guests to have on. You want to reach the largest possible audience, of course, but still not overlook intellectual topics. We realize the following discussion of anthropology may not be of interest to everyone, but I have always maintained that if presented properly, any topic can be good television. With that in mind, welcome, please. The... I just, I just want to tell you one thing. When we build up our national defenses, it isn't with the idea that someday you're going to go fight a war. The idea in building them up is that we will be so strong that no other generation of young Americans will have to bleed their lives into foreign battlefields or beachheads someplace out in the oceans because we will lose. And I promise you, I promise you one more thing, that as we build up our national defense, our national security, we will not stop or let up one minute with getting those other fellows across the table from us and now talking legitimate, 
arms reductions. Well, that's all except to tell you, you just confirm everything that Dave and I and the others there believe. You have to get about 50 miles at least away from the Potomac River and the district to get back to the real world. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It wasn't exactly working. And she was exactly suing again. <laughs> and it got to the point where they issued a warrant for my arrest to put me in the jailhouse. And I didn't feel like going to jail. I, it's not my kind of thing. You know, uh -huh. a, so I went to Canada. Huh. Now, uh, this is 34 years ago. Yes, isn't it? Now, what... Uh, <laughs> But what does the woman want from you? Freud asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, I figure that um, my ex-wife, to my knowledge, never had a, what we would call a paying job. And she uh, gradually divested herself of outside interests. Mm -hmm. Did I'm she... the only interest left. <laughs> did, did she ever... Re... I'm what she does. Oh, I see. She just... Litigation is kind of a hobby with her. Now, she never remarried? No. Too busy. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but now, by virtue of your appearance here... Yeah. Aren't you subjecting yourself to possible arrest? No, no. Um... The, um... When I was living in Massachusetts, which is after I was living in Canada, they were suing me there in Massachusetts. And I thought, I'm tired of this, so I will go back to New York and go to jail. <laughs> and a lawyer I ran into somewhere said, well, let me go down and see if that warrant is still out. And some judge said to him, or this is what the lawyer told me, oh, well, that's not operative now. Mm -hmm. They have to start again oh. and to put you in jail. So I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to live forever. America. Retrieving ducks and things in the in the thing. No kidding. Poodles these, were duck retrievers, yeah, these, huh? These uh, balls with around the feet protect the pul the uh, the pulse points where they, where they where they're sensitive okay. around the thing. So they originally had a purpose, and they right. got a little out of hand somewhere in the hands of a groomer. I think. We've changed. It. <laughs> Wonderful dog. We have to move on. Thank you, sir. Okay. And Mr. Paul Edwards and Ms. Gilvery's high interest. Rita Walker is next with her. Is this a Borzoi? Borzoi. Borzoi is a Russian wolfhound. All right. And that's a, the dogs of the czars of Russia. <laughs> oh my. Woo! How do you do? Are, are these, this is of course a purebred dog, are they skittish or nasty or? Uh... No. Show dogs don't dare be skittish or nasty because they gotta have nerves of steel to get through one of these dog shows. Yeah? No, they, these, uh, these of course are a, a coursing hound. Uh, they were used to what run, do you mean by run, coursing running, uh, running dogs uh -huh. to chase down wolves in the 
in Russia. Yeah, and they were and, uh, good at it, I guess. Huh? They're fast, yeah. as you can see. They're build to build for speed. Yeah. Now, uh, of the two dogs we've seen, has are they both winners or? This is a Canadian champion, isn't it, Rita? Yes, he's Canadian. And champion. he's pointed uh, in an American show. They all dogs for Westminster have to have at least one championship point in order to be entered at Westminster, because otherwise. Uh, uh, it oh, improves the quality of the So this show, dog right here has one champion point. Has four, actually. He has four. Has yeah, four. Yeah, he's oh. shown in one, one show and we got four points all in one place down in Atlantic City. Terrific. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting your dog. This is a Borzoi. Thank you very much for being here. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, next we have a bloodhound. A bloodhound. A bloodhound. This is Charlie Sexton, the handler of the dog, and this is Serendipity's... <laughs> Nick Chopper, how do you do? Well, it looks like a bad tailor. Here comes New York City's salute to good posture, and followed by the runner-up in that contest. Now, this float is not being pushed. That's actually being operated by 20 men and women. Here comes the entry from the Bronx Zoo. Apparently, the puma escaped. There, of course, is the handler. Now, this float is made up of 170,000 live orchids flown in from Hawaii. This is a salute to the recent drug war. There's a man on his way to the East River to drop off a rival. And oh, now this guy is the famous parade crasher, Art Minzer. He shows up every year. And of course, the theme of this year's parade is cardboard on wheels. <laughs> and coming up, uh, this man won the governor's trophy for best use of fur. And of course, one day all cardboard is hoped that it'll have wheels and uh, these people make all of their own costumes. Oh, this man won the President's Trophy for best use of notebook paper. Oh, there's Art Minzer, the parade crasher again. Get the... Oh, this is wonderful. This is New York Governor Kerry's precision drill team. Oh, there's that guy again. And of course, anytime you have a... Oh, wait a minute, some sort of a mishap somewhere along the parade route. And uh, right after this parade ends, they start working next year. And uh, of course, coming up uh, after the parade, every parade has a couple of guys marching to a different drummer. And here we have a few. Just a reminder, right after this parade, of course, the football game will begin live. Well, this guy again. And I think, well, once more for Art Minzer. There you go, the annual. February 8th Day Parade, coming up on this television program, Francis Ford Coppola. Oh. <laughs> and you know, and truly, the speedboat was called Godfather Part Two. I remember. And you really, and there did really go, was huh? a speedboat, but it's gone now. It, right now, your assessment is the things that look I like it'll be a money out of it. My mind is on the movie starting in Tulsa in a week and a half. I have 40 uh, 17 year olds in a room that are trying out for this picture literally right now. Yeah. And uh, we ran away from the screen test to come and do the show and be with you. And then we're going to go back to these kids. You got a room full of 17 year olds? <laughs> going to be a, a film I want to see. Um, we have to pause here. We'll be right back and continue talking to this film. Sir, I'm more with you here. How do you feel about the, uh, by the way, what is your name? John Ward. John, how are you? How do you feel about the announcement from the mayor's office last night that as of May 1st, the Empire State Building will be torn down to make room for a five-story parking garage to solve the parking problem? It's very unfortunate. It's one of the few uh, landmarks that we have left that should be preserved. Yes, most people seem to feel that way. All right, sir, very kind of you to share your thoughts you. with me. Okay. Hi there. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola is with us, of course. And you mentioned one thing about the, you felt that One from the Heart now was in pretty good shape and you were in your mind at least on to other projects. Uh, I want to ask you about that, but also in getting back to the, the heat and the controversy and so forth that seems to be generated with this one, do you enjoy that or would you just as soon the thing slipped out and was distributed successfully and became a huge hit without well, I, I don't, well, slipped out doesn't sound too good, but huge hit sounds fine. Yeah. Right? <laughs> For a second. Uh, we'll be right back, folks. How do you feel about the announcement last night from the mayor's office that as of May 1st, the Empire State Building will be torn down to make room for a five-story parking garage to help the parking problem? How do you feel about that? I didn't like it at all. You didn't like uh, that, huh? Uh, you think the Empire State Building should uh, 
Stay where it is. Stay where it is. That's the main excitement in New York City. People going out to Empire State Building. Yeah. And out to the city. It is something it's that's really familiar. Nice, yeah. How about the parking problem? Do you have any thoughts about how they are? Uh, I don't think so. There's, that? Big par There's no okay. big parking problem around here. Okay. After 6 o'clock, you know. So Maybe what we need is not a solving of the parking problem, but more than a fewer crashes. I don't know. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir, for helping me out. Hi there. Welcome back to the show here, and uh, Francis Ford Coppola is here. I have to uh, ask you about the uh, Marlon Brando. Uh, you know him. 